Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is Paul Henry once again with our Four Winds Church online teaching ministry, and I want to welcome you again to our study. We're starting this new series on Psalm 27 and the 40 days of repentance. <clears throat> this is as we are moving into these fall holidays, and no, they're not the fall holidays that America typically observes, uh, you know, that being, uh, you know, Halloween and Thanksgiving and Christmas and that kind of stuff or whatever. It's the fall biblical uh, holidays, uh, the day of trumpets, the day of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles. That's the Western English version of those three holidays. And I want to thank you for joining me in this study, and I hope it has been, and I hope it will continue to be a blessing to you. Let's pray together before we dive off into this uh, second part in this study as we look at these uh, 40 days of repentance. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're grateful for your grace and mercy. Lord, I pray that you would be with those today that are hurting, those that are struggling, those that are fighting disease, sickness, uh, fear, uh, loss, um, that are just hurting so deeply. Uh, there are names that cross my mind, and you know who they are. And God, I just pray that you would be with them in a very, very special way. God, I pray that you'd be with all of us and wrap us up in your loving arms. Uh, help us to have the courage to cry out to you, Daddy, Abba, Father, I hurt. Please be with me. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, you would strengthen us and encourage us as we study your word. And I pray all this in Yeshua's name. And all God's people said, amen. So as we talked last week, this month uh, and the 10 days just after this biblical month of Elul uh, are these traditional days known as the 40 days of repentance. And it's during these days, like we talked about last week, that it's the tradition to read Psalm 27. And I mentioned to you last week that I thought it would be wise for us to start reading the 27th Psalm, maybe every day, let this start to sink in and think about ways that we can cry out to God the same way that King David was in this Psalm and to turn our hearts back to God. So why read this particular psalm during this time of the year? Now, once again, I said this is an old custom of reading Psalm 27 during these days of repentance in preparation for these high holy days that are swiftly approaching in about a month, uh, less than a month. Uh, from right now, we will already have uh, the, the Day of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. We'll have the Day of Atonement. Uh, and then shortly after that, we will have the Feast of Tabernacles. So part of the reason or one of the reasonings behind reading this psalm uh, during these 40 days uh, is the idea that these three holy days of trumpets, atonement and tabernacles are alluded to at least in this psalm. So there's a midrash, a discussion on this psalm stating that the word in Hebrew, ori, which means my light, that that refers to Rosh Hashanah. You've heard it said Rosh Hashanah. That's a kind of a Texas way of saying it. Ha is for the preposition the so it's Rosh, head of the year. So it's Rosh Hashanah. Um, that's uh, the day of trumpets. And like I said last week, that's been, it adds to the confusion because they renamed it technically as, you know, Happy New Year. It's the new year. It's the day of trumpets. Um, it's technically not the, the new year. Uh, it's the day of trumpets. We'll get into studying that a little later when we get even closer to that particular day. But uh, it's said that in there, in this psalm where it says, my light, that that's a reference to Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and that the word yeshi, which is for, it's the Hebrew word, 
which in English would be my salvation. But literally, you have to stop and think about this, the literal translation would be more like my Jesus or my Yeshua. This is why he was. they were told to name him Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Um, and, and then, um, and so this is a reference, sorry, this my salvation or the salvation of God, uh, my salvation, he is my salvation, is a reference to atonement that he would atone for and cover our sins and we would find forgiveness. And then David even mentions in the psalm that God would hide him in his sukkah, which they believe is a direct reference to sukkot or tabernacles. His sukkah is God's tent, God's tabernacle, God's dwelling place, which is our English version of sukkah would be tabernacles, that we would stay in these temporary tabernacles. So because of these three connections, it became a tradition to use this psalm during these days of repentance, or the word in Hebrew is teshuva, as a repentance or returning to God. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. So then the last 10 days, it's like this there's a crescendo growing in repenting to the last 10 days in between the day of trumpets and the day of atonement of the 10 days of awe. So I want to read to you something about these 10 days. Uh, This is taken from the book Entering the High Holy Days by R. Hammer, which is a JPS uh, publication. And it says this, all is a loose translation of the Hebrew word nora, which can also be translated as reverence. The word characterizes this season of the year, which lasts from the 1st to the 10th of Tishri, the 7th month in the Jewish calendar. In post-biblical times, this season was expanded to include the month of Elul, which is the prior month to Tishri and later was extended two weeks beyond Yom Kippur to Rosh Havah uh, at the conclusion of the Harvest Festival of Sukkot. So this high holy day period is a time of solemn rejoicing, of fear of judgment, coupled with confidence of atonement, of both pleasant anticipation of the new year and anxiety for the future. In the words of the old folk saying, even the fish in the sea tremble at the approach of the days of awe. So I wanted you to see that their traditional view of this is this mix of a solemn assembly and a solemn time of uh, looking into oneself, uh, being fearful of judgment, and at the same time filled with confidence that God would atone for our past, our sins, uh, that we would be forgiven, and we would be able to dwell in his house forever. So I want to read from Psalms 27 once again. This time I want to read verses 3 through 6. So this is Psalm 27, verses 3 through 6, and it says, Though an army camp besieges me, my heart will not fear. Though war breaks out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I have asked of Yahweh that I will seek to dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Yahweh and to meditate in his temple. For the day of trouble, he will hide me in his sukkah. Conceal me in the shelter of his tent and set me high upon a rock. Then will my head be high above my enemies around me in his tabernacle or sukkah. I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, sing praises to Adonai or like I like to say, Yalva. So there's a few things in here I want you to notice. 
David says that even in the midst of war, he will be confident. Well, excuse me. It doesn't say that he will have great faith, but confidence, not in himself, but in God. You see, faith is trusting in something, but here he says he will be confident. So this is a move beyond faith or trust, but to a point of full, full assurance of something. Confidence is reaching the point that you not only believe or trust in something, but are expecting it to happen without doubt or without even thought. It's expecting it to be as though it's already happened. Total confidence. There's no wavering doubt or thought, even that it's even possible for it not to be. So I believe that it's important to notice his heart and what he really desires when he says he will be confident. So he says that even though this troubling times is all around me, there's a war besieging me. The idea of being besieged means that there's an encampment of hostile enemies all around you with the purpose of either killing you or starving you out meaning no way of escape. And he says, even though that be the case, I will be confident. But it's more than just safety and deliverance. It's the desire to dwell in the house of God and behold his beauty. And the very center of all of this is to be able to meditate or contemplate inside God's house, the temple. In these troubled times and national chaos that we are in, I believe it's important and healthy to focus on this fact. I had no way of knowing of what was going to transpire this week until the news hit. It's crazy. I just want you to understand that it's not national security that's going to bring peace to each one of us. It's also not a win in the elections that's going to establish days of peace and prosperity. It's not even in a physical deliverance on a personal basis that's going to bring peace. I want you to think for a second that Daniel and his his three fan, friends, his Babylonian names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in captivity in Babylon in times of great stress, physical danger, and yet they experienced peace and purpose. Their time there was not a party by any means. It was hard and harsh and deadly, and yet they experienced God's presence, his peace, and his purpose for their lives. Just this week, there was another assassination attempt on President Trump, the second one in just as many months. Now, while this is horrible and the world is filled with hateful people, even to the point of violence without cause, we cannot allow this to affect and influence us to forfeit. Pay attention to what I'm about to say. We cannot allow what's going on in the world what's going on in our country, what's going on in our lives, what's going on in politics, what's what you see on the news. This is why I told you during these 40 days, you're better off turning it off. Let it go. Just let it go. Let it go. It's going to be okay. We cannot allow this stuff to influence us to the point that we forfeit our pursuit of, of the peace of God. There's nothing on this earth that's worth that price. Nothing. Not even time is worth the price of giving up on the peace of God and pursuing that with every ounce of energy 
you have. When all seems lost, we have to run toward God and not away from him. It seems like all too often the mob mentality, when the chaos hits, they run away from God. Some will run to religion, but not really run to God. Sad to say, not until in most cases we are forced to run to him. I personally would rather choose to run to him instead of being forced to run to him. But we also have to acknowledge that the scriptures are clear that the days ahead, they're also, just like with Daniel, Meshach, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're not going to be easy. And in fact, compared to God's word, it's going to be lawless, filled with lawlessness, and that's going to increase, and it's going to increase to the point that the love of many is going to grow cold, meaning that lawlessness will get to the point to where people will say, you know what, I don't care anymore. Boom. You're not going to have any ounce of love or remorse or pity or empathy at all. We're already seeing that. Don't let it affect you that way. It's okay. Turn it off. These days ahead are going to be like that. That's just what we're told. Therefore, on this earth, during this lifetime, we should not be expecting days of ease and ease and peace and unity. But we can find peace. When we are close to God, when we run to him and not to the news and not to the polling booth and not to argue your stuff on the internet and post your opinion, it's, 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 a, it's amazing. Folks, it's not God that's moved away. We moved away from him. Watch this. Society all through history has always moved toward a more liberal and less godly lifestyle and set of morals every single time. Every time. Um, When it looks like everything is starting to go completely out of control, We should run to the one who is in total control of everything. It's only in him that you and I are going to find peace. However, there's a caveat to this. To be able to be in his presence in peace, we have to first acknowledge that we need to return to him. That means, once again, that we have to turn from our own ways and desires and return to his pattern, his purposes, and his ways. It's just that simple. You you can't just say, well, I want to return to God. How? Just, I I don't know. I'm going to pray more. Um, There's actually a way to do this. And it involves more than just praying, saying a hubba dubba 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 to, to whatever. <laughs> there's, a, there's a way to do that. Um, we have to stop being so stubborn and self centered. We have to acknowledge that his ways are the right ways, his instructions are the right instructions, his truth is truth. Watch this. Even if you and I don't understand it, it's still the truth. Mm. It's the act of submission to his authority in every part of our lives. Repentance is not just the act of saying we're sorry, but turning from those attitudes and actions that are contrary to to his ways and return to 
his ways. The idea of repentance, the Jewish word is, the Hebrew word is teshuva, is not just to turn away from your actions. That would mean to turn away from your actions could be just 45 degrees or a 90 degree, or it could even be maybe a 360 degree turn. While you're turning, you end up going right back to the way you used to live. Can anybody here relate to that? Teshuva means to not do that. It means to make a 180 degree turn, to turn completely around away from where we were headed and return back to God and his ways. But repentance, teshuva, it is also impossible to do unless we believe that God not only can, but would respond to our cry for help. We have to believe in the goodness and grace of God, the loving patience he has shown towards us and to those who call upon him. That's why when the scriptures say that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, we have to believe that that is true. Not just a hope, but an actual belief. We have to actually believe it in in all of the same confidence, confidence, that David said in this psalm, he will be confident. Now, folks, this takes me back to our recent big picture study. How are we going to repent when we refuse and return to Shuva? How are we going to return to God if we refuse to admit that his instructions are even applicable to our lives? It, you can't. How are you going to return to him and his ways when you don't agree with him and his ways? When we simply pick and choose only the parts of scriptures that we want to agree with, how are we really submitting to his authority? How can we how can we return to his ways and desires for our lives when we don't even believe that his instructions actually still apply to us. They do, folks. They do. Now, as we continue in this 40 days of repentance study on the book on the uh, on Psalm 27, our challenge is to have this as our one desire, and that is to be with him in his house, meditating on his word and his ways for our lives. We're going to see this continue, this idea and this theme in this song. Crying out to him for his grace and forgiveness, drawing us closer and closer to him without any pride or preconceived idea for how anything around us should or should not be. Even though an army be encamped around us, besieging us, we will be confident in God and only ask this one thing, to seek him, to be in his presence, to behold his beauty, to meditate on his word in his tabernacle, in his temple. We need to be trusting him for his goodness in this life and also in the life to come. Trusting in him for ourselves and our loved ones. Now, sometimes we are even faced with the hardest and darkest of times when maybe a loved one dies and leaves this world before we do. We're faced with fears and doubts about what we could have or should have or what we should have done or what we wish we had done or hadn't done. Not only are we today looking at these biblical days of trumpets and atonement and tabernacles. But maybe for you and for me, there's this personal day of trumpets that maybe has even already sounded or something that you're fearful about that's coming. You know it's looming. Maybe it's uh, the uh, not having the assurance that you're even going to have a job this winter. Uh, Maybe it's not sure if you're going to be able to continue to afford your house or be able to supply what's needed for your family. Um, 
we are all faced with the rising cost of living that's literally going through the roof. It's affecting not only your groceries and your gas, but your insurance and your property taxes, uh, uh, the, the utility bills, all of these fundamental things skyrocketing because fundamental costs went through the roof. We're all looking at that. If you're looking at this, maybe you're having, or maybe if you're having this personal day of trumpets, how are you to respond to that? That with that coming, how are we supposed to respond as a fellowship, as a people, as a fellowship of believers, as a neighborhood, as a family, as a city, as a nation? But all that starts with our individual responses. Not just waiting on the nation to respond and then I'll join in, but saying, I'm going to respond, though no one go with me. Turn and run to the Father, not just away from your ways, but to Him. Turn to His ways, His Word, and turn from our ways and wishes and wants. I believe God wants us to understand that he is our hope and our joy. He is our only hope for real and lasting peace, even in the midst of troubled times. The one thing we should ask from God, think about that. The one thing, how often is our prayers or are our prayers focused on God, this is what I need. I need a miracle and blah, 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 blah. I need this and I need that. And I need you to show me this. I need you to show me that. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. Instead, you know what? How about if I forget all of those wishes, wants, and greeds, and things? And how about this? God, I just want to be near to you. With or without my health, with or without my money, with or without my fame, my fortune, my heritage, my name, whatever. I just want to be near you. I just want to behold your grace and your glory and your love for me. And I just want to sit down and think about the beauty, the magnitude of your word and its impact on my life. Wow. Where would the world be today? Where would you be today? If for the last 10 years, the last 10 months, the last 10 days, if you and I would have consistently been saying, God, there's only one thing I really want. There's only one thing I really need. I don't need more time. I don't need more money. I don't need more health. I don't need the pain to stop. I don't need the suffering to stop. I don't need the promise for a bright future on this earth with my family and friends and loved ones. There's only one thing I really need. That's to see you and be with you and be in your presence and to have the privilege, the awesome privilege of being able to be in your temple and meditate and contemplate and think about and talk about your glorious word that is literally unfathomable. I will never in all of eternity find the end to the richness of your word and your grace and mercy. It's that powerful. Wow. To stay at his house, his temple, and meditate on his word. To be consumed with him, watch this, without distraction. Where would we be if we were that focused, that intent on asking that from God? 
you start asking God for that, I promise you, he will start answering that prayer. If you can't start with that, do what I did so many, many years ago. God put a hunger in my heart for your word, your ways, your plans and purposes that I cannot stir up on my own. God, give me a desire and a love for your word that I don't have. God, please spark that fire within me. Start there. And I promise you, he'll do it. He's done it for me. I know he'll do it for you. I want you to be at peace. And here's why. God cares for you. If this has been helpful to you, man, give us a thumbs up and uh, leave a comment. If you need us, reach out to us at 41schurch.org. All spelled out. Uh, We'd love to hear from you. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it's bringing you peace and a direction and calm in the midst of this crazy storm that we're in. Chaos, hatred, anger, road rage. In the midst of all of that, you can have peace. While the world rages all around you, this one thing I desire, let me read it again. One thing I have asked of God that I will seek, I will seek, I'm going to go after this, to dwell in the house of God all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of God and to meditate in his temple contemplate God, his beauty, his house, his ways, his word, and that in this time of trouble, knowing that he will shelter me in his tent. God bless you. I really do hope to see you soon. We pray this prayer over us. Shalom. May God bless you and keep you. That word there means guard, protect. May God be so gracious to you that he causes his face to smile upon you. May God literally lift up his countenance, that Shekinah glory that was almost dripping off of Moses' face when he would spend time with God. It was so radiant that the people made him put a veil over his face because it literally scared him. May God cause that Shekinah glory to literally envelop you in his presence and through that process give you his shalom. That word means a lot more than just peace and the cessation of violence and chaos. It means all the goodness of God flowing your direction. And through that process, God literally placed his name upon you, basically saying, that one is mine. God bless you. I hope you're well and blessed. And I really do hope to see you soon. God bless. 